Okay, well, let's kick it off. I presume I'm live here, Kate. People can hear me? Cool. Um, so first of all, I just want to welcome all our guests to today's webinar. We're a little uh, expansive in our title of the right way to do transportation cost benefit analysis. Um, really what we're focusing on today is the necessity towards incorporating health costs into transportation decisions. And we really have a fabulous panel to join us today. Um, we have Lawrence Frank of Urban Design for Health and America Walks board member, Kim Anderson of the San Joaquin Council of Governments in California, Alex Cohn of the Genesee Transportation Council in Rochester, New York, and Deb Reardon of the Regional Transportation Commission in Southern Nevada. And I think for our panelists, what's so fascinating is that they have all been actively engaged in some way or another with regional planning and really struggling with the choosing between alternatives and, and what do we know about them. So I'm Mike McGinn, the Executive Director of America Walks. Kate Spielmaker is our uh, facilitator and, and doing the tech behind the scenes. A couple of logistical things before we get started. Um, first, we just want to thank our partners. Really uh, grateful to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and encourage you to join Active People Healthy Nation, which is their nationwide goal to promote physical activity. We're also uh, proud to have other supporters as well. Um, in addition to our institutional partners, we are extremely grateful for the individuals who donate to America Walks and help fuel our work around advocacy. Um, join us. We would love to have you. So um, I think I've already introduced the panel. I think we have a slide for them as well. Up oh, Before we get to that, if you have a question for the panelists or hosts, please enter it under the Q&A section in your user dashboard. Um, we, we'd love to see it. And we will attempt to uh, pull those out at the end and ask the panelists those questions. That's my job with uh, Kate's help to try to sort those out. Um, next slide. And here we go. Um, I've already mentioned our speakers. You can see them visually. And with that, I am going to get to the presentation, which is why we're all here, and turn it over to uh, Larry Frank um, to, to begin the presentation. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you all for, I think it's time for me to start. Indeed. <laughs> to, to begin speaking. Um, so thank you, Mike. Thank you so much for America, uh, to America Walks for hosting this webinar. I'm really excited to um, hear from um, my colleagues and uh, clients who uh, are joining us to talk about how they have been using the software tools that we've been developing based on the research that we've been doing over the last several decades. Uh, myself and many others, uh, really building the evidence base on how the physical design of communities affects our health. But as we've titled this talk, it's not just about that, it's really about the economics behind that and how these decisions have massive uh, implications in terms of what we build and how we design our communities uh, on our health, that trickles down into very significant healthcare uh, costs. Um, or hopefully reductions. Uh, I wanted to mention and thank Alan Brooks with the US EPA, who is my client um, and has been supporting uh, the development of the National Public Health Assessment Model um, and uh, EPA in general, and also other organizations, including Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and uh, many others. Um, I, I wanted to mention, uh, uh, as you'll hear from uh, Kim Anderson with the San Joaquin Council of Governments and Deb Reardon, uh, with the Regional Transportation Commission and Alex Cohn at the Genesee Transportation Council, their perspectives on how to use how they're using these tools and really they're the innovators in practice, really taking this work and making it applicable and really be, they're the game changers and I'm really excited to have them join. Finally, I am a professor at UC San Diego where the research is done that goes into these tools that get applied in practice. So I'm gonna try to share my screen now for one second. I got this right. Okay, this is, right, my screen can be seen. 
Yep, you're good. Thank you. Okay, well, um, there's been a call to action to promote walking. America Walks uh, as a leading NGO in the country, really trying to uh, promote um, infrastructure to support walking. Uh, the federal government uh, uh, initiative, as soon as Biden became president, uh, um, the Justice 40 initiative with 40% of overall benefits of certain federal investments to go into disadvantaged community, a spatial issue really trying to target investments where it's needed the most into underserved areas that are overburdened by the impacts of pollution and climate change. The call to action preceding that um, in the, about 2015 or 16, step it up, uh, really once the, by, by 2015, even 2010, evidence was pretty clear. It's intuitive. How we physically build our environments shapes our options, how we travel and our exposures to good and bad things, such as air pollution, noise, and injury risk. Um, so, so these are some early initiatives. Um, but uh, along the way, we seem to have not been able to really bend the curve. Um, so I'm going to start off with some evidence that's compelling us to move forward even faster and further uh, growth in cardiovascular disease across ethnicities. You can see a real significant gap between uh, um, Black community versus um, uh, other, uh, you know, with the cardiovascular disease prevalence much higher, but most, most alarming, uh, steadily increasing for all ethnicities, uh, but the rates are, are profoundly high. Um, this translates, and here's a few, well, obesity, cardiovascular disease and diabetes prevalence into terms of annual healthcare costs are massive. These are in billions. Uh, we know that's a very large proportion of the federal uh, budget uh, or, or the overall gross domestic product. So we're talking about big dollars when we talk about health impacts uh, of the built environment, which plays a very significant attributable role in shaping chronic disease burden. That has been established. What we're doing as a society is really um, many things, um, and government is really trying to do its best with the infrastructure spending coming up uh, and happening, starting to happen, reappropriating road space, taking back the streets. So we've seen during COVID a, a willingness. Uh, this is in San Diego, where I now live, um, looking at the Normal Street Promenade or the Gas Lamp Promenade, where retrofitting is occurring, where we're re reappropriating road space. Uh, for other purposes, but it's come with considerable resistance, uh, significant resistance to densification and taking space from the car. So it's our work and the importance for all of us to be able to demonstrate and document the important benefits of doing so. Uh, 2021 with Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, a um, couple trillion, there's the numbers vary, but somewhere around two plus trillion dollars the reauthorization of transportation spending plus increases in equity-driven and clean energy transportation solutions, uh, a very creative piece of legislation and a lot of funding beginning to flow and targeting that money into the right places for the right projects based on evidence of what will perform the best is critical. And that's what the work that we do and others are doing is trying to accomplish. Um, so I think we're all maybe pretty familiar uh, repair existing infrastructure, improve transportation options for millions of Americans, and reduce GHG emissions. Health and climate change are two sides of the same coin when it comes to the built environment, for the most part. Investing in existing communities and making it safer and more appealing and uh, able for us to travel uh, without um, needing to consume a lot of carbon is critical. So, this is the research side of me um, now, just going through the process, the logic, the quantifying the pathways. So on the left, you see, these are the things that we can affect through policy, transportation infrastructure, land use or walkability, which is mostly what walkability has been. The pedestrian environment, that micro scale seating and lighting and street furniture and eyes on the street, all those things um, really matter. And then green space, that affects our behaviors, our travel patterns, our diet, our physical activity, and our ability to interact socially in a happenstance way with neighbors and others that we might not otherwise have the ability to meet. That also comes with exposures to air pollution, 
uh, traffic, safety, and crime and noise, depending on how we design our communities. We as a species, our biology, we respond by changes in body weight, inflammation, and stress to the environment. Very clear evidence. And these things interact through space and time to affect our physical and mental wellness. Hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, and on the mental health side, dementia, depression are all a function of the physical environment and the decisions that we make, which affects healthcare utilization and cost. More simply put, um, on the macro, big stuff is transportation accessibility, transit, which works synergistically with active transportation. Every trip begins on foot um, and complete communities. That's the walkability, the mixed use, the density, the proximity, and the connectivity working together to make destinations nearby, to provide nearby destinations and make it possible to walk there. But we can't walk there if the stuff on the right, the micro scale, the pedestrian environment is not in place as well. That's really, relatively speaking, an easier lift. Changing and retrofitting the pedestrian environment comes with limited or no resistance from neighbors in terms of benefits that, that accrue relative to uh, trying to densify an existing or low density environment. There is resistance to, uh, to pedestrian environment improvements in terms of gentrification now though, which is a whole other area which is concerned for displacement, which we um, probably won't touch upon adequately in this presentation, but is there and needs to be considered of how to have programs that support retention in communities. So from the left to the right in this diagram is a continuum of walkability from the most car dependent to the most walkable. This actually is an adaptation of Andreas Dewani's um, transect. And we're using it as a five step ladder from the least to the most walkable. And you can see images, this is from Vancouver, uh, where you see aerial images down below and then uh, on the road, three dimensional street level images of experience of place. And so as we move from the left to the right, this is scaffolding that information onto a, um, uh, you can see from the car dependent on the left compared to those in the most car dependent, those in the moderately walkable or extremely walkable environments are 27% are and 39% less likely um, to uh, have diabetes. The diabetes prevalence rates decline precipitously in Vancouver as walkability increases when controlling for demographic characteristics. This is a published paper, as you see below, just came out last year. Sense of community. So I picked one physical and now one mental health side. On the upside, sense of community um, uh, goes, and, and also a positive benefit of walkability for the more fortunate, and I'll get at this in a moment later, for the more unfortunate members of society, the more underserved, walkability is not a hands down healthy thing. Um, for those, the general population, uh, we do see positive relationships. Um, but moderately walkable and walkable communities um, are more likely to have strong sense of community uh, than those that are car dependent. And the relationship is somewhat intuitive. So now um, on the causal impacts, taking back the streets. This is a study that we did, and I'm going to present three papers on it fairly quickly. Um, downtown Vancouver put in a, a greenway. They took a fairly walkable street, but reappropriated the road space to cars, uh, to, excuse me, to pedestrians and cyclists. And we studied before and after. Here's our sample along that corridor. About 250 people along the corridor and the same amount as controls after, before, before and after this greenway got built. We resu the, the results are quite compelling. Within 300 meters of this corridor, this is before, pretty nice street, um, but, it got changed a lot and the relative utility or benefit of driving went down and the ease of biking and walking went up. And our people's behavior along the corridor within 300 meters, they generated 21% less GHG emissions after the Greenway got built than those further away. Those within the same distance close were twice as likely to meet recommended physical activity levels after the Greenway was built. Those within 300 meters again, were um, uh, three, uh, five-fold more likely to bike than beforehand. So major increases in cycling. Each of these is a published paper. 
that's just a little bit of causal evidence. There's not that much, I mean, those types of intervention studies are still fairly rare, but there's more of it. There's lots of literature that just grabbed um, to show demonstrated, you know, what other factors have people been studying? This, this review of reviews. So that's how much research is out there that we now have. Land use mix and sprawl at the top of the heap being the most studied and significantly associated with obesity. A reduction, aesthetics, overall food environment, parks, and you can see the list goes on. There's a ton and wealth of literature now on the topic, but the art and skill really is focusing, I think, in the need is on translating that into a tool, such as the National Public Health Assessment Model, which is built to address the gap to uniform health outcomes and measurement for decision makers that we will hear from today. It's to forecast future health conditions of alternative investments, again, funded by US EPA with some support uh, through the National Environment Database that was funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on its built natural social environment measures as part of the culture of health. So this is where NFAM has been applied so far. And I will mention later on uh, other tools that have been used and developed for this purpose as well, or similar purposes that are quite different in their structure and design. Um, we've had 12 applications in 10 different regions mostly for long range transportation plans as we'll hear from today, but there are other purposes such as environmental justice focus within uh, the Houston area um, regarding freeway expansion. Uh, this is part of scenario planning where um, we create the ability to bring health into the scenario planning process so that health considerations are, are included. We have done an amazing job of externalizing health from the cost benefit analysis process. Um, and others such as climate impacts. And that's what this talk is about, is, is the argument to not only include them, but that we can. NFAM comes preloaded with data from the American Community Survey five-year data on demographic fa factors and the National Environment Database that I just presented on the built environment uh, features that are listed here. That's the physical stuff, the predictors. On the outcome side, we use the California Health Interview Survey large sample of about 54,000 participants. It's a health surveillance system for the state of California. We build our equations in California and generalize to the nation through a lookup table process that's very, very rigorous. And then we externally validate to local conditions. Uh, the travel behavior and physical activity data come from the National Household Travel Survey of about 41,000 people. So NFAM starts off by loading spatial information, social and cultural metrics, as I just mentioned, the built and natural environment metrics. That all gets loaded. And then we run the statistical models and summarize. And these, each one of these is a model. So we predict body mass index, physical activity, uh, overweight, obesity, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, that is, hypertension, coronary heart disease, depression, and annualized cost of illness. So participants in our data are linked, matched, spatially joined with environmental data. I just ran through this, but in kind of summary, we spatially join all these layers of physical environment data to each person and compare their behaviors with the environments where they live. And we look for systematic or patterns of relationships. And in fact, they do exist. That's what the research does. Um, Cross-sectionally or correlationally at one point in time, we're able to compare people, but we lack the ability to do causal assessment like that Greenway investment in Vancouver and other studies. That gives us the comfort and, and, and shows the science that that causal relationship is there. It's essential and more of that needs to be done. So um, in summary, we're able to compare the distribution walkable communities that are higher in density, more diverse in land use, that have more options and travel modes, such as investments are, have been made in pedestrian environments and infrastructure, and shorter trips are possible, where trips are shorter, destinations are nearby, um, we see very different uh, lower chronic disease than those with the opposite configurations. So this is what NFAM uh, produced, one of an example of an output. This is in the Chicago region, where we just showed a predicted surface of estimated annual health costs um, related to type 2 diabetes. And you can see where the health costs vary uh, from the most to the least by the darker colors. The same features, predictors, 
and demographics are there. And then the output puts, as mentioned in this one, is just the last one, the annualized cost of illness. In an example of a transit station area, this was early days. This was about 2013 or 14 in San Diego, uh, down near the Mexican border along the San Diego trolley is a transit station area known as Palomar Gateway in the city of Chula Vista. This is their planning area. We ran NFAM there, or it's NFAM's grandfather, I guess, or grandmother. Uh, all adult uh, health metrics uh, improved. Um, this is using the California Health Interview Survey. We saw a significant increase in minutes of daily active transportation, 15.4% uh, reduction in high blood pressure, and a 9.6% reduction in type 2 diabetes. That's a pretty significant shift for the adopted plan that they had for that area. You tend to see more swing and impact in smaller areas where you're making a bigger change. I just repeat, I just stated the adult. We also looked these numbers I just uh, mentioned. We also looked at children and teens and found significant 29% uh, increase in active travel to school, 18% uh, increase in daily minutes of transport walking, uh, but also predicted increases in asthma. So it's not all wind. That makes sense because increased exposure to air pollution. So we expect to see uh, these relationships be complicated by the fact that air pollution exposure is positively associated with walkability. This is a problem for us and something in the research that we need to address, and we are working on that now. This is just an output table that NFAM provides uh, that shows kind of all these reports. In, in the Los Angeles, their long-range transportation plan is, is something we have been working with with the Los Angeles of uh, the Southern California Association of Governments, who's been a very uh, good client of ours and actually helped uh, us develop the tools that we have built. Um, this is a long-range plan uh, um, assessment that was done with Urban Footprint developed by Calthorpe Analytics, where we started doing some analysis about eight years ago, and we looked at their long-range plan, the current trend, uh, versus their adopted plan, which shows benefits, increases in active transportation uh, and reductions in all the health impacts, but minor. You may look at that and go, that's not so much. But a 1% or 2% reduction in things like type 2 diabetes is 200 or four, between 200 and 400,000 cases. So very small shifts at the population level across the surface of a massive region is very significant economically and health-wise. For the, for the area of Glendale, a small community, we see more significant uh, changes and reductions and benefits. This is just a wrapping up in Houston. Um, we um, have been looking at roadway widening in downtown Houston. Uh, uh, Transportation Commissioner Buttigieg, uh, Secretary of Transportation uh, Buttigieg, when he became uh, Secretary uh, and his department uh, used Title VI to injunct the development and roadway widening that was happening in downtown Houston. And we helped with that by using NFAM to document the adverse health effects of the roadway expansion through, through schools and in, uh, in, the, in the community uh, that were disadvantaged um, in nature, uh, lower income area. So the economic benefits, I'm gonna wrap up with a discussion around the money part, uh, the financial impacts. So economic benefits of active transportation infrastructure investments come in many forms capital construction and maintenance. Uh, that money gets spent and has a multiplier effect, uh, uh, the construction part in the economy. Equipment and services and tourism, it supports all that, but we've been looking at healthcare cost savings and uh, workforce productivity with less employee absenteeism, big financial impact. So we characterize the built environment. This is what I just presented model physical activity um, and health impact. So it's through physical activity and obesity that we have chronic health impacts. And we model that public health impact, and then we apply a cost of illness, which is a linear um, extrapolation or a projection with a unit cost for each illness that's avoided. You can also go further into input output analysis uh, and cost benefit by monetizing the direct and indirect effects. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what we build in terms of transportation infrastructure affects development decisions that affects travel patterns, health, and cost. Fairly straightforward in its um, linear depiction here. Um, and then we're able to predict these outcomes that I've already mentioned. 
So um, methods for health monetization include value of statistical life, there's mortality, the value of life, and then there's morbidity, which is the cost of illness. On the value of life side, uh, applications um, uh, to avoided mortality, and an example of the tool is the uh, WHO's, WHO's HEAT tool, the Health and Economic Assessment Tool. And that is looking at that side of the um, equation, which is really on the value of life, mortality. Cost of illness applications of, of to, uh, to avoided morbidity examples include input output modeling, such as REMI Insight and Implan, uh, but, but really NFAM, the tool I just presented developed by Urban Design for Health and ITHIM, uh, I-T-H-I-M is also focused on uh, morbidity. So the cost of illness um, is, is national cost attributable to a disease and elevates health as an important active transportation co-benefit. Then there's the direct costs, which are healthcare expenditures, which is what it looks at most directly and most simplistically, mo money exchange for healthcare, obviously intuitive. Indirect costs are things like employee absenteeism, reduced workforce productivity from illness, early disability. Um, I didn't mention, but um, we've done a lot of research and others have as well with COVID, that having a chronic disease and then getting exposed to COVID came with much worse uh, severity and mortality as well. So there's that connection that has been very well documented. Uh, so we have reduced productivity for those with more disease, more work missed, more disability, and increased mortality. This is a study that we that came out of another project we did for the Southern California Association of Governments, the MPO for Los Angeles uh, region. So this is for every dollar spent on active transportation infrastructure over a 24-year um, period from 2016 to 2040, uh, Los Angeles has passed, as many of you know, uh, initiative, major funding for active transport, for uh, transit and, and transportation in general, but mostly transit and active. Uh, $8.41 payback for every dollar spent as broken apart into these different segments. We hired AECOM uh, um, to run the REMI model. This is the model that's used to justify often roadway expansion by, by workforce productivity as an argument in part that we can't afford often not to widen the road, the argument is because of all the lost productivity because people are stuck in traffic. Well, that workforce productivity also can be flipped on in another way, which is healthy people produce more. They're more obviously more productive uh, and workforce participation is greater. So there's a lot of money being lost uh, through chronic disease. For the 13 billion spent, it was projected that would generate 113 billion over the life of the plan. Big, big box. So in summary, uh, I showed this diagram, but basically um, that was for Los Angeles, the $8.41 payback um, through the factors that I mentioned. I think I'll just jump ahead and, and summarize. Um, so NFAM uh, has a web app cap cap capabilities um, it is now becoming available and being released um, in, uh, at the census track level, um, and you'll be able to map, and, and it's ready to be applied anywhere in the United States. All the existing inputs and data are available at the census track level and also block group level uh, for the nation, um, and uh, will be able to be used much more widely. Um, NFAM is one approach. I mentioned it. Um, the CDC produces, Centers for Disease Control produces the places uh, data and indices that are now coming out of it, the Environmental Justice Index, um, and approaches multi-level modeling, similar to uh, statistical models, but demographics only. So places right now doesn't account for the physical environment characteristics of the uh, uh, where people live um, in its predictions at the small area level using the behavioral risk factor surveillance system data, uh, which is a surveillance system for the United States. Um, so that's um, what it does. And then there's ITHM and HEAT that I mentioned, ITHM on the morbidity, HEAT on the mortality side. Um, and that is a whole different approach, which is more aggregate so far with regional average projections, doesn't get down to the granularity of the small area level um, that NFAM does but maybe uh, changing over time. So finally, NFAM starts with community design and works its way through to predict behaviors and exposures 
and then chronic disease and costs, where ITHM and HEAT um, actually start with a predicted uh, level of physical activity, doesn't start at the environmental level, uh, uh, scale, and then goes across the bottom, as you can see, to cover the rest. Um, I now look forward to turning over uh, uh, the baton to uh, hear from uh, my uh, our colleagues and uh, my clients uh, who are going to present on their work in Las Vegas, Rochester, New York, uh, upstate New York, Genesee, Finger Lakes re region, Lakes region, and uh, southern uh, South Stockton Promise Zone. Thank you very much and look forward to your comments and feedback. Over, over to you, Kim. Sure. Thank you, Larry. Uh, let me go ahead and get the share screen going um, while I'm doing that. Um, of course, my name is, uh, is Kim Anderson, and I'm the Deputy Director of Planning uh, at the San Joaquin Council of Governments. Make sure I'm grabbing the right screen here. There we go. I'll assume you've got uh, something that says integrating health into scenario planning in front of you. So yep, you're good. Good, thank you. Um, Larry went into a lot of the technical aspects and I'm going to uh, avoid uh, doing that for the most part. Uh, what I wanna talk to you about, uh, we were, whoops, didn't mean to do that. We were one of the early uh, adopters of um, health metrics, and in some ways it was almost by accident. Um, as many of you are familiar uh, with the California environment, um, back, I think it was 08 or 09, uh, California passed Senate Bill uh, 375 that asked regional agencies to look in a more intentional way at the built environment as part of our long range transportation planning. And really what it was looking at was reducing greenhouse gas emissions and reducing vehicle miles traveled or VMT. And so in 2014, we embarked on our first uh, regional transportation plan to include a sustainable community strategy. Uh, but we didn't have really good ways to measure uh, the outcomes. Uh, travel demand models, uh, are good at looking at um, what they were designed for, which would be to look at um, Clean Air Act requirements. And so while there were tools developed to help us measure greenhouse gas reductions and vehicle miles traveled, we didn't really have a good way of looking at uh, health outcomes. Um, and for one thing, you know, travel demand models that we use and still use are not um, fine-grained enough. They really don't uh, contain a good um, representation of pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure, and they certainly don't go down uh, to the neighborhood label or neighborhood level. So in 2017, we started working with um, UD4H, Urban Design for Health, and what it was was to help us with implementation of that 24 re 2014 Regional Transportation Plan. And so what they produced for us uh, at that time, there we, go. Uh, we did two things. We looked at overall how to apply uh, health metrics uh, to our scenarios uh, that we had developed through Envision Tomorrow in that 2014 plan. What would it look like if we analyzed them once one against another? What were the metrics that we could uh, look at as far as health? Um, you know, besides the anecdotal or literature. Uh, that was available to say that uh, improve air quality, you improve health outcomes. Uh, and so those are some of those co-benefits that SB 375 asked us to look at. Um, so that study grew into a small area look at the South Stockton Promise Zone. Uh, there's a picture up here of part of that area. Um, the South Stockton Promise Zone is one of the most disadvantaged uh, locations in the state. Uh, and as you look at the incidents, uh, and we had good working relationships with our local health department and some of our advocates uh, as well in the area. So we knew what those health outcomes looked like in that community. 
And in working with Larry and his team, we were able to quantify those and quantify uh, for the first time really what those benefits uh, could be. So the health equity study uh, allowed us to have a more intentional focus on health benefits and the benefits of active transportation. And it also helped us look uh, and address environmental justice uh, questions uh, through the regional transportation plan in a more robust, uh, more, more robust way. And then again, I talked about the small area study. So let's talk about how then this grew into uh, working with UD4H to do comparisons of our overall foundational scenarios for our regional transportation plan. As you can see on your screen here, uh, we looked at four different scenarios and what that meant uh, for health. And those metrics for the first time were presented along, uh, alongside our you know, normal transportation related metrics that looked at vehicle miles of travel. Uh, it looked at what our land use uh, inputs had been. You know, what was the density of the design of the built environment that we were looking at? And Larry and his team were able to take the information from our scenario development and turn it into these metrics that we then could present uh, to the general public. And this just talks a little bit about the South Stockton Promise Zone. Uh, and for those of you at all familiar with the Stockton area, um, the area in general tends to be relatively disadvantaged. And then you look uh, more closely at the South Stockton area and even compared to the city of Stockton and the county itself, uh, you see a uh, higher concentration of communities of color, you see higher concentrations of poverty uh, and some of these other uh, indices uh, indicating the need for investment in the area but this allowed us to show this robustly and it gave us a language to talk to our, uh, both our policymakers and our advocates uh, about what needed to be done. So this shows um, the area, this is concentrating on the uh, area in Stockton. So the promise zone uh, is outlined there and South Stockton is generally uh, south of the Crosstown Freeway or Highway 4 in the middle of that. But as you can see the change between 2015 uh, and 2035, and this one is looking uh, specifically at walking uh, for transportation and the vast improvement that you see uh, in these areas. And I will say the study was, um, One of the first times that we were able to quantify this and it allowed us to focus uh, in these areas. And I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, more about how we've used these studies more, more than on a, a strict cost benefit analysis, but some of the projects and uh, additional studies that have come out of this work. So again, this is looking at those changes. And Larry talked about this. These look like relatively small changes when you look at the absolute change uh, in some of these physical activity metrics. But uh, when you get to the percent change and sort of understand what that means for the persons that are living uh, in these areas, it, it can be um, life changing. And again, uh, looking at other metrics uh, with chronic disease and uh, chronic and cardiovascular disease. You know, again, you can see improvements uh, in these health outcomes related to high blood pressure and coronary heart disease. And then, uh, of course, we brought, um, who knew that this um, partnership was gonna last quite this long when we started it back in 2017, but for our recently adopted 2022 Regional Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy, uh, we were able again uh, to look and not only the difference in disadvantaged communities, but we looked in low, moderate and high and highest resource areas to see where did we get uh, the biggest improvement uh, with transportation, uh, active transportation infrastructure improvements. 
And this has led to uh, some other uh, studies and outcomes, and we're looking forward to our continued um, partnership. But uh, just to say, many of these neighborhoods, uh, we went on to do a study of active transportation in priority neighborhoods that looked at the most disadvantaged communities and what investments in uh, transportation, active transportation could do to improve those communities. Many jurisdictions uh, based on both our work with uh, UD4H and on some of the subsequent studies uh, have initiated their own neighborhood level assessments and we're seeing higher levels of investment uh, in those areas. Uh, more recently, the San Joaquin Council of Governments was awarded a sustainable transportation equity program or a STEP grant that has now spawned the Stockton Mobility Collective what we're looking there is uh, car share, uh, electric car share and uh, pedal assist uh, bike share programs being piloted in the South Stockton neighborhood uh, as a way to be a first mile, last mile connection to transit. It includes a uh, mobility app, uh, mobility as a service uh, application that's bringing all those modes together. And it's also allowed us to look at um, these old studies that we've done and what transportation investments will now support the sustainable transportation equity program. Uh, we're considering using health metrics uh, in active transportation program scoring. That's something we haven't implemented till now. And we're considering using these health metrics uh, for our regional early action program or REAP planning. And this is a program uh, in California where um, the money is really to um, spawn affordable housing production, but it also has the, the co-mandate of reducing vehicle miles of travel uh, and also affirmatively furthering fair housing. So we're looking at the way health metrics can inform uh, perhaps the location of transportation hubs to aid in affordable housing in infill locations. And these are all in their early in their early forms, but what I wanted to emphasize uh, here is what our early studies with UD4H uh, have done for us. Again, it's this language to uh, speak with our policymakers. Um, they have an interest in improving their communities as well, and these kinds of metrics uh, and their use in justifying some of these later uh, grants. Um, just I can't emphasize how important those have been. Um, and with that, I think I probably hit up against my uh, my time allotment. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions anybody might have about our use of the metrics, our partnership with UD4H, or with any of the, the grant programs and improvements that I've talked about. Um, but with that, I will uh, end my part of the presentation and turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Kim. Alex, you're up. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alex Cohen. I'm the Assistant Director of uh, the Chance of Transportation Council, the MPO in Rochester, New York. Um, wanted to kind of go through a little bit about how we got involved in scenario planning as a process and as an initiative in our region. Um, contrary to um, Kim was just mentioning in California, we don't have a sustainable community strategies requirement yet, but um, I think, you know, we seek to ask a lot of the same questions. Um, I've certainly been keeping my ear to the ground and watching what they've been doing in California as we kind of prepare for perhaps doing other similar plans as well. Um, just a little, a little bit of background. Um, um, Mike, by the way, am I showing uh, my presentation screen or the... Um, yes, I see it. And okay, the not, presentation not, the, not, the, not the presenter view. Thank you. My it, two monitors. Actually, you um, are the presenter view, Alex, if you wanted to switch. Thank yep. you. Windows. I knew we did before. There you go. Um, thank you, guys. Um, just as a bit of background, uh, uh, GTC, we are a nine-county MPO, so about 1.2 million people, you know, almost 200 municipalities. So really a large um, swath of area and really, um, you know, tremendously different contexts. I mean, you know, our high-tech, dense urban core in the city of 
Rochester, I mean, we, you know, in high tech um, industrial centers, such as like the University of Rochester Laser Labs working on this week's fusion power announcement too. Out in Seneca and Yates County, where we have large Amish and Mennonite populations. So really um, quite a large bit of diversity. Um, you know, why did I think it was important for us as particularly a small growth region um, to really get involved in scenario planning? Um, so much we see in scenario planning, um, you know, from when I was previously working in Texas and in other places too, it's it's almost like a chicken little story. Like, oh, you know, we're gonna grow by a million, two million people, what are we gonna do? Um, but, you know, that's not so much the situation here. Um, we've had uh, slow population growth, but I think that doesn't uh, serve to really show the amount of really change uh, that's happening. Uh, not maybe an aggregate, but really, you know, so many still continuing moving pieces if you dial in the microscope just a couple of ticks further. Um, we've had, you know, continuing changes in employment, suffering a lot of job sprawl, and, you know, particularly a number of inequities as well. But I'm absolutely bullish about what we have in the Rochester and Figure Lakes region. Um, we have, you know, really strengthening uh, urban core in Rochester, something that maybe you couldn't say when I was younger. And uh, Larry being a Rochester native himself, uh, has certainly seen such a, uh, a change, um, growth in multiple industries. And um, happily, what I can say on the last two bullets is, you know, strong investments recently in tra trans and active transportation um, and, you know, really partnerships um, that I think help Rochester really stand out as well. And that I really hope that scenario planning can bring a lot of the context to. Um, just kind of go through a couple of some of the bullets. You know, one thing that I think scenario planning does is really, you know, broaden the conversation. Um, you know, so we're not just worrying about short-term issues or this latest press release or this ribbon cutting, but really thinking towards 2040, 2050. Um, that's, you know, MPOs, we're in the context providing business. So, you know, what can we do to not just then think about, okay, just the transportation network, but really think about, where future growth, future opportunities, and the connections that we have to our range of partners throughout the region. Uh, and that kind of, uh, you know, as NPOs, we get the that planning budget. And so we can support data development. We can support the use of models beyond just the travel demand model um, that our partners can use. And I think and scenario planning and deploying a scenario planning tool um, is something that we've, um, you know, sought to provide to our partners. Um, and with that, not just existing partners and transportation and planning, but really uh, fostering and cementing relationships with public health, economic development, um, and the list is, is kind of growing. So it's really exciting to see what we can do there to crew you know, to really cross pollinate new plans and studies um, and really, you know, get us um, and, and get this technical capacity and practice in place so we really can um, be ready as new, um, new regulatory frameworks take place, particularly in regards to climate change. Um, and also so we can be more involved, particularly in the health space as well. Uh, so, GTC, we went with through we went through uh, an evaluation of scenario planning processes and you know and providers out there, and we decided to go with the urban footprint software as a service. Um, just a quick overview of some of the overall metrics. Um, certainly, some that uh, Kim had touched on as well here. Um, you know, particularly emissions and fiscal impacts being um, something that was really marked for us. Uh, but really, as part of the process as well, we were lucky to work with Larry and go beyond urban footprint and kind of tack on uh, the National Public Health Assessment model. Uh, we put the, the Genesee Finger Lakes uh, label on it as well. Um, and so it's something that we can then uh, understand some of the public health impacts of some of the plans and projects. That we're doing as well. And I think it's really a fruitful um, area for us to go to. 
So today I just wanted to um, provide a little bit of um, overview of one case study that we had um, used this for. Uh, so just the map right here is sort of the West, is West Main Street, um, about, about a mile corridor um, just west of downtown Rochester. Uh, really an area that suffered from disinvestment and is an environmental justice area of concern for, you know, last 30, 40 years. Um, in addition, kind of within this area, we have a particularly brownfield opportunity area. So it's been a real, um, an area that's undergone a lot of additional planning as well. Uh, just to give a little bit of context about some of the plans that we've been doing um, and you know, it's in the area. Uh, so West Main Street is really kind of a four lane arterial, almost a strode. Uh, you know, really four lanes, undivided parking. I mean, a real mix of transit and pedestrian uses, though, also within this commercial and mixed use corridor. So it's a lot of activity, but um, it's really still auto dominated and doesn't really reflect the composition of the neighborhood and really best serve them as well as it can. So, you know, looking at the conditions of the area as well, there's really some strong health disparities. Uh, you know, this area kind of in the table, West Main Street, uh, that study area, I mean, there's striking uh, health uh, standards are there. Uh, and, you know, you can see almost inversely, uh, the fact that the lack of green space is so much less than you know the rest of even just the city of Rochester and broader suburban Monroe County, and as a result, the cost of illness is striking, and those are costs borne by you know both the public and private sectors. So you know what we think we can do to you know how we can shape the built environment is really going to have those positive externalities that really benefit the rest of the community. Uh, so, you know, this study area was picked because it's really, there were really two ongoing planning efforts throughout the area. One was an overall corridor study, um, looking at West Main Street from downtown out to the Bull's Head uh, Center. And, you know, just this one rendering right here shows a bit of how we're going to, through both um, maintenance project and then really to a full reconstruction, do some iterative steps to reduce the number of lane miles. Uh, widen the sidewalks, increase bicycle facilities, um, and really have better transit amenities. Uh, and secondly, is really at, at the western edge of the project, the Bull's Head, um, which is it's really just a bad intersection right here of just, you know, four to five RTOs just kind of coming together, a lot of pavement, a lot of stoplights, you know, huge crossing distances um, and has really just been disinvested for a number of years and buildings have cleared out. Um, to the right, you see just a bit of some of the outline of some of the proposed redevelopments and a development partner has been there. Um, you know, highlight really particularly too is just some of the number of trees that are gonna be planted in the area. I mean, it's an area that's lacked in street trees, you know, suffers from, no shade provided, really no public space or any real sense of place at that area. So it will really be a great, you know, not just be an aesthetic improvement for the community, but really, uh, you know, have some tremendous health outpacks, impacts. So uh, Larry's team helped us with um, even just tweaking a few metrics um, just treating a couple of factors in the area that really reflect these two plans, um, increasing the number of parks and the amount of tree canopy uh, to match countywide averages. Uh, and so by doing so, we've seen these, see these reductions in chronic diseases. So uh, really tremendous impacts for not that large of investments. Um, you know, just taking some you know, incorporating more park space into these redevelopments, um, planting more trees as part of these uh, road and street capital projects. 
uh, things that are, we're not really measuring, you know, previously measured as part of uh, transportation capital planning. We haven't really done that as be our benefit cost analyses, um, but, you know, the costs that are the, bene the benefits of these health impacts um, are quite considerable and something that we're going to look to try to monetize more as part of our uh, planning process. And I think can be probably a bit of a paradigm shift. So looking forward, uh, there's just, um, there's a lot of future um, directions we want to take. I think we're just beginning to scratch the surface here in Rochester. Uh, you know, we really want to broaden the training uh, for both uh, agency staff and other stakeholders just to make them aware and just to get the ball rolling and kind of ideas generating on how we can um, utilize the NFAM tool. Uh, you know, GTC, we um, are strong proponents of spending our agency's dollars for more uh, local planning initiatives, uh, looking to sort of match these public health benefits um, is, and to incorporate them into our air quality and safety plans, uh, looking to incorporate uh, health equity into how we're prioritizing um, investments, public active transportation, public transportation, and you know even our roadway projects as well. Um, and much like uh, San Joaquin COG, um, using NFAM for our overall long range transportation plan. And lastly, really just kind of getting the word out on the connection of public health and transportation. You know, there's really, there's sort of two different silos, but I think by bringing it together, I think there's really a lot of a strong alliance that we can be creating. And just my contact information there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And let's turn it over to Deb for the final presentation. And then there are a very large number of, this is Mike, the, um, our moderator, so many great questions in the chat. We'll do our best to get to them after the presentations, but we'll also work on getting to them in our follow-up materials that we, uh, we post a blog, we post the video, and we'll do our best to, to cover them there as well. So with that, Deb. Great, thanks so much, Mike. Um, hi everyone, I'm Deb Reardon, Regional Planning Manager here at the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada. Um, and so the, here, sorry about that, thanks. The MPO leads um, Regional Transportation Planning for a Clark County that includes the Las Vegas metro area, as well as outlying um, portions of the region. Um, our current population includes about 2.3 or so million people, and it's expected to grow quite a bit over the next 30 years. Um, we're looking at a population of adding another million people to the region. And while there's some really good examples that are happening now of higher densities, more mixed use development, um, that hasn't always been the case. And so what a lot of what we are dealing with as a community is really more suburban style development patterns um, with lower densities, um, it's much more separated land uses and auto oriented street networks. Um, so these conditions combined have really led to a situation where the majority of our residents and visitors are driving um, and have less of that daily activity as part of their life. Um, and this has resulted in some really negative health consequences as well. Um, so these factors combined and this awareness really drove us to complete our study, which we're calling the Transportation Impacts on Health Study, um, completed um, in partnership with um, UD4H as well as a few local consultants. Um, and this study had four primary goals. Um, the first was to analyze the transportation related health costs um, due to inactivity, pollution, and noise. Um, and other, other factors. So what is that connection from a monetary perspective? Um, second, we wanted to really begin to integrate those health costs into our decision-making process. And we've um, worked with UD4H who developed a couple of new tools that I'll share today to kind of further that integration. Next, um, we added in a couple of performance measures um, focused on transportation equity and health to increase um, transparency as well as accountability. And lastly, a big outcome of our study was really just raising awareness of this very direct correlation between the decisions that we're making 
today and the impacts for future. Um, so first, let's take a quick look at our regional economic impacts. And so we really looked at, we meaning UD4H, looked at those, um, those conditions that are most affected by transportation, things like diabetes, heart disease, and asthma. And, and so far, we, look, we found that there were 1.3 million individual cases of those diseases. Um, when those diseases are monetized, the estimated annual health care cost is $2.9 billion, um, which is very significant. Um, that combined with the estimated cost of loss of life, um, which is around, a, th this data was, um, I think, a 2019 data, 186 traffic crash deaths. Unfortunately, that number is continuing to rise. Um, at the time, so we'll just go with this, it was $1.9 billion. So we're nearing, you know, getting close to a $5 billion impact um, related to health. So this, throwing these numbers out really begins to raise awareness um, and, and start questioning our decision. Um, and so we have, now we know the problem, you know, what are we going to do about it? And so the first tool in that direction was a transportation health composite index. And so you've seen some of these indices before. Um, I think Larry shared um, CDC, for example, earlier in our presentation, Justice 40. And so this is, this is kind of similar. And so it really comes together on kind of three main groups of factors that have 30 or so indices together. I'm not gonna catalog all of them, but they're in the buckets of vulnerability. So social conditions, as well as those chronic diseases, um, the second factor is transportation risk, so risk of crashes, exposure to pollution, as well as extreme heat that is a significant issue in our region. And then lastly, the health-related transportation access are really lack thereof. So places that don't have access to high comfort, active transportation infrastructure, parks, um, and, and healthy places, frankly. And so when we combine all of these factors together, um, it turns into a map that looks like this. And so this is our new health composite index score. Um, the areas that are shown in red or orange have um, a more high vulnerability based on some of those socioeconomic and other factors I described and low transportation access. And so from this map, you can really see that there are locations in the region where some health focused investments can really make a more significant impact. Um, and this disease prevalence as well as access is not equally distributed. Um, there are, you know, more opportunities for improvement around some of our more diverse, um, low-income parts of town, um, kind of in the, um, the east side, um, urban core. I think, you know, this data really, really illustrates a strong need there. And so that's tool number one. And the second tool I'll share with you during our time together is our use of the public health assessment model. Um, Dr. Frank already went through this, so I'm just gonna really focus on this middle box, what our proposed interventions are, and then what the result is. And so we tested um, our onboard um, mobility plan. That's our regional vision for improving, for improving transit access and developing more sustainable communities. Um, this plan that was modeled included uh, a building out a high capacity transit network, as well as adding in more transit oriented development locations um, at those proposed locations, um, I should say conceptual, um, would have higher densities, um, income would go up as well as population numbers would go up to really um, support more transit use. And then we also added in more frequent service throughout the region. And so, Based on um, research evidence that UD4H um, shared earlier, um, the health impacts of these investments um, really showed um, health and cost impacts in the expected direction. And so um, you can see here in row one, the health cost per adult went down by around 11%, as well as some of our, um, our health conditions also showed improvement. So BMI, type two diabetes, hypertension, coronary heart disease, um, they all moved in a positive direction and largely due to the mode shift. So we, we see a, a doubling of transit use, which is great, um, as well as an a pretty significant increase in walking for transportation. So it's important to note that this particular scenario didn't really show 
a lot for bikes. So, so that shows that there's probably more to do there. Um, and another interesting outcome is that this outcome was just for the 90,000 or 100,000 people that live near these improvements. When we ran the model for the whole region, the impact was much smaller. Um, and so that tells us as planners that there's a lot more that needs to be done in, a, in order to show uh, a bigger health impact for more people. So next steps, um, we're kind of at the beginning phase of applying these tools. Um, and so we are really looking at applying the health index. We've already started that. Um, our public participation plan identifies it as our tool to identify disadvantaged communities um, and directing outreach tactics to be more inclusive, particularly in those locations. Um, the index is also being used as we, we just did a call for projects for um, infrastructure bill dollars. We um, included the index as one of the factors at to prioritize projects, which is really exciting. That's the, the first time we've done something like that. Um, at the scenario planning level, we're planning to use this in our next regional transportation plan update. Um, that was something that, um, you know, health was not considered as part of the cost benefit analysis previously. Um, and then at the local scale, we're testing it out at a college area land use and transportation plan um, to look at how improved walkability, more transit-oriented development surrounding a new college could shift um, health outcomes. And then lastly, as we work to use this model, we're interested in identifying other, other things that it might be able to do and gaps. And so um, in addition to um, our interest in exploring health impacts of, of noise and pollution that I think were mentioned earlier today, we're really especially also concerned around illnesses related to extreme heat. So Las Vegas is one of the um, fastest warming communities across the country. And so we're interested in testing out how especially enhanced pedestrian infrastructure, tree canopy could make our um, impact those heat related illnesses in the future. Um, so just in closing, um, I just wanted to share that when uh, Dr. Frank and I share this work with the RTC board, that includes elected officials from all the local agencies. They make decisions around transportation plans, transit services, and those related budgets. There was definitely an increased awareness of that connection between transportation and health and a, the direction to us as staff to continue to use these tools um, in our future regional as well as local plans. So as advocates, and I consider myself as an advocate, as a staff person, um, and as a resident um, for walking as well as health, um, we can, I think, really continue to use these kinds of tools to demonstrate these health costs and benefits in, in, to make um, impact on these future decisions um, that our leaders are making today. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to Mike for questions and answers. Thank you. And love to have our panelists back as well. Um, that was really powerful. And as I said, there were a lot of great questions in the chat. Um, we'll try to get, we'll get to some of them, but I just wanna make a comment and then ask a question that's, that's kind of at a very high level. First of all, just astounding presentations. Um, by the way, um, for, for viewers, I'm a former mayor of Seattle and served on our regional MPO, Puget Sound Regional Council and the Metropolitan Planning Organizations for listeners you know, they're very critical in the transportation funding world because in order to get federal funding, I think I'm getting this right, in order to get federal funding, you need to be in the regional plan. And the regional plan is set by the MPO, which is a federally authorized entity, which may have other duties. They are also given a number of other duties in their region since they are a regional body. Um, but the getting getting your project into the plan is really critical for those that are trying to get a capital lift for a project. And one of the things that was mentioned, I'm sure many of our listeners know this, is that very often the analysis that is done looks at what is the time savings to driver of relieving congestion by adding more lanes, whether to surface streets or freeways. And that's problematic on a number of reasons, one of them being that adding more lanes does not necessarily lead to any more time savings uh, due to the concept of induced demand, but it's also very narrow and just a small uh, 
criticism, it never me measures the delay of pedestrians waiting at a red light, um, which, by the way, weren't at all necessary before cars, but, but that's an aside. Um, so it, it's very problematic for that reason, whether that's truly a measure, but that's the measure. And so the question I want to ask, and it's been raised by several people in the Q&A, from your experience, given kind of the history of how costs and benefits are measured and your work at trying to introduce this concept of health costs into the MPO analysis, how do those two things intersect in the actual decision making from your experience? And, and how what, what would it take to change the, the paradigm for analyzing the uh, how how new roadway expansion is, uh, you know, analyzed for its costs and benefits. And I'll, whoever wants to go first. Okay, I'll call on Kim first. <laughs> oh, Deb was ready. I'll call on Deb. She's ready to go. Um, well, I can uh, just express what we're what we're doing now. Um, and so, as a first step, I would say um, our regional transportation plan right now. Um, prioritizes um, congestion, maintenance, um, economic development, um, and other factors, I will say. And those were the things that it historically have been included in our project selection process. And so in our most recent call for projects, we included a factor for um, active transportation projects that are located within these disadvantaged communities identified by the health index. And so I think that's a huge step in the right direction, um, but it, I don't want to, um, I want to be clear that those other factors are still part of that decision-making process. So it's, um, it's, it's a step and it's an equal um, kind of consideration at this point to those others. Got it. Uh, Alex, I thought I saw you leaning in. Yeah, I, th I think as we, you know, because we'll do cost benefit analysis for safety projects, but sometimes as we look at perhaps some of these complete corridors, some of these health benefits are, you know, as great, if not greater, perhaps. Um, so I think it's, you know, as you know, because we're playing catch up, I think, to some of the measures that we have with congestion and crash analysis, um, as we you know, really develop these tools and make them more operational, it's going to become a more day-to-day -day part of the process. Um, so I think that's kind of some of the context here. I mean, it's, um, is that we're really working to make this um, really a regular part of the project development and selection process. Yeah, and I think I would agree, Mike, I can uh, just jump in. Uh, of course, California has, uh, other legislation that has us now moving away from a congestion metric to a vehicle miles of travel metric. Yeah, as as usual, California starts with the, the regulatory um, piece of it, and then some of those changes flow from that. Uh, I will say part of the issue, and we identified this in our you know, discussion with our policymakers, uh, a lot of our funding sources come with specific uh, evaluation metrics. When we had a look at our last regional transportation plan as to how much of the funding is actually truly um, flexible and what can be funded with it, I think it was on the neighborhood of 9% of the funding. And so you do run into this problem. So very often, instead of using uh, these metrics as prioritization of the entire package of the project list, very often those projects have already been evaluated through the criteria in their specific funding streams. So that can be an issue uh, for us. And so a lot of it has to do with the flexibility of the funds that we have to work with. Uh, if we were to you know, talk, <laughs> you know, talk very um, specifically about what's needed. Um, but, you know, that said, as Deb said, with those areas where we can incorporate the health metrics, um, we, we will try to do that. Uh, you know, but again, a lot of times it's on the global, it, it's the language that we're able to use to talk about the benefits of the plan in total uh, and what changes, and then looking at it at the neighborhood scale. So what can we do now at a neighborhood scale that will affect uh, that neighborhood and then move it into other neighborhoods? Let me let me dig into that a little bit. So when you say that you know that that you have constraints, um, 
are are these are these things such as the legislature saying you shall prioritize or the legislature having already chosen projects in their funding packages as being the projects that will be done you know or what degree is it federal i'm just curious as the types of constraints that are placed at the front end as to what ends up in the in the plan well certainly i mean some some federal funds are specifically uh for uh highway and they're specifically for highway expansion. And so that's that's what gets funded with those. You know, there are you know, congestion uh, mitigation air quality uh, funds. Those are looking more at air quality measures. And so when you evaluate a program of projects and a call for projects, you're using those specific funding criteria. Um, active transportation projects, you know, clearly we've got different metrics that we're looking at active transportation projects with. Yeah, it's just to say that flexibility in the funding source um, may not be as much as is, is imagined. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. And I would, I would also say that um, there may be more flexibility in the funding sources than the culture of, of transportation funding permits. You know, I'm saying this for the benefit of our listeners. Flexible <laughs> federal highway funds have been used for active transportation and sidewalks and bus improvements, et cetera. But um, certain portions of the of the you know your political ecosystem in a state may think federal highway funds can only be for highways. So there's a political aspect to that as well. Yeah. Well, and Mike, I would say with the uh, current infrastructure act, I mean, we are looking at sort of morphing our processes. You know, obviously we want to position, and I'm sure my the other speakers would say the same thing. We want to position ourselves to bring in the greatest amount of funding. And so we're looking very closely at what those new funding streams are going to be. Yeah, and that's a really fair point. Um, again, for listeners, um, the new federal infrastructure bill you know, 30% of the dollars in transportation go through specific grant programs, which have criteria for them. And there are a lot of great additional dollars in the active transportation space that didn't exist before. Approximately 70% still goes to the states to use as flexible funds. And, and one of the things about the last Congress was that they did not adopt further constraints. There was an internal debate as to whether they would put more of an emphasis on climate or safety with those flexible funds and they did not so the you know in order to get the bill through congress um states retain flexibility so there is but but it does mean that there are more flexible funds at the state level which could be you know spent in different ways depending on um the political preferences of the of the state and the state legislature um larry yeah, I just wanted to say that I think, and I think Deb referred to it um, recently, was that Livable Centers Initiative, uh, the Atlanta Regional Commission long ago was like first, I think, to adopt targeted funding into existing centers. And that actually is what, what kicked off the research that, that I was working on back then 25 years ago or so. And it's nice to see, and I think, so that's one way, and Deb said there are, there are targeted funds that can happen, but what we just heard was sort of a continuum of responses, and it just made me wonder how this work may help position you all better for this infrastructure funding that has, i just curious if you think, that it seems like it might, it's a bit of a leading question to be honest, but um, it just seems like given the way the infrastructure bill is written, you might be in a better position to go after the funding because you've already started down the path of what they're asking for. You feel that's true? I, I saw heads nod. Let's yes. love to hear an answer. Yeah. <laughs> I would say so. I think, uh, you know, going through this process has really uh, strengthened the case we've made for building and, you know, centers and maintaining um, and strengthening really the existing urban fabric that we have right now. Um, Particularly, one of even the strongest cases we made was actually preserving rural centers out in Genesee County. So I think there's, I th it's sort of uh, as we, um, you know, plant a flag with kind of smart growth and then defend it and then invest in it. It's sort of a snowballing effect of planning and other initiatives and investments, kind of keep the ball going. Thank you. 
Yeah, we've um, we haven't done it yet, but um, have considered including this data as part of grant applications. Um, to really kind of bolster the, um, to better articulate the benefits of a complete street project, for example. So that's uh, that's something that we're interested in doing. And and I will say, even though I said that the in order to get the legislation through, the you know flexible fund the rules for flexible funding remained the same. The fact is that it, the, this administration, this executive administration. D d does have different priorities and does have regulatory tools at, at its discretion within the constraints set by the legislature. Kind of goes back to the comment uh, Deb was making about constraints on what they can do within a regional plan. There's there's always uh, upstream constraints uh, from the political realm um, but pe that people can attempt to work within. You know, Larry, a question we got from multiple people. They love the MFAM product. Is it, um, how is that accessible to people? How can people bring that product into their work? Is it publicly accessible or is it, uh, or, or, sure. or, or is it a proprietary item? Um, so multiple ways, it's, it's a bit of both. Um, there will be a publicly released version soon um, at the track level with a certain subset, of, a set of outcomes uh, that cover quite a bit. Um, and what we suspect most people will do is they may, um, it's not that expensive to run because we already have all the data it needs um, for baseline. And then you can project, you can predict what ifs uh, off of the equations that, that, are, that, that go with it. So that should be, but running it is a bit of a learning experience on the front end. So what we expect will be that perhaps it's a bit of a software uh, for uh, as a service kind of a setup where we may help people uh, under a contract basis to get, we're doing that with a number of users. What we really want is people to be able to use it. So I think each uh, of, um, I, I think Deb, Alex, and Kim, each in their own organizations have been working to develop internal capacity in Los Angeles. They're running it on their own now, um, you know. But they're a huge MPO. Um, uh, but uh, um, we we see that happening. And then there's um, there'll be a version of NFAM that is more detailed that offers more capacity that we will have uh, um, that we will um, be hired to use and apply uh, separately. So it's a mixture of, of, of both public and uh, um, uh, proprietary. And that EPA is um, supporting it. So on that, um, another question we got um, was, we're, I'm concerned that weight BMI obesity is being used as a health out outcome given BMI's problematic basis and racism, shaky science, and our cultural bias against fat people. Weight itself isn't a health problem. Things like diabetes, which may be related, are the health problem. Um, What's the public health? What, what, Larry, what's the response to that or thoughts <laughs> on that? Yeah, um, so there, there's a physical activity is really what we want people to be is active. Um, that's the, the message and the health benefit um, and eat, you know healthy eating, active living. But nonetheless, one of the best predictors and the way the models work is the relationship between the physical environment and uh, BMI or obesity. There's no question that obesity is indeed a trigger for chronic disease. And this person actually notes that, but the Surgeon General made a decision to make obesity a chronic disease. And so, you know, they're the health experts. So maybe they should take this up with the Surgeon General uh, who made that determination. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it was something that, uh, uh, maybe wasn't something I personally was expecting, but it is a condition. Um, it is, and it is definitely, um, I think there's a sensitivity across demographic subgroups. You know, the biggest thing that we, we haven't really mentioned this directly today, I showed a graph at the beginning, chronic disease is concentrated in the underserved, low income minority populations. And that's really the part of the core cornerstone of this equity social justice issue that the biggest cost benefit we're gonna get is investing in communities that are underserved to address this concentration of chronic disease. And a lot of it is triggered through unhealthy body weight. And that's just what the science shows. It's not something that we like to see, but it helps us geographically focus and really make a more informed decision about where these investments are gonna go. Right. 
Okay, thank you. And you know, I there's another point that you raise in your presentation that I'm almost asking a question. <laughs> I'm not sure this is a this is more of a comment than a question, as I heard at many town halls as mayor, um, which was the way in which um, you mentioned the the effects on lower income communities. The other is the way in which our land use policies have tended to put apartment buildings and denser residential uses on high volume roadways, which has also, so therefore the air pollution effects of proximity to pollution can overwhelm, as I, what I heard you saying, can overwhelm the walkability benefits of living in such a neighborhood. Um, so that really, um, is it fair to suggest that that really uh, takes us to the idea, one, that we should reduce pollution on our roadways, but but that we should also separate residential uses, allow re allowed more dense residential uses further away from high volume roadways, and that they shouldn't just be a buffer for the single family zone. And especially movement of goods. Um, I mean, I remember, you know, in Seattle, Mike, I think, I don't know if you were mayor at the time, but that's something the city of Seattle worked, I mean, Regions across the country, many um, you know, have worked hard on this, but um, there's no there's no question that this um, it, walkability is not a health prescription for the underserved and for poorest members of our society. To the extent that, in fact, in the most walkable environments, which are inherently denser, for the most underserved, are actually less healthy. So it's a it's an elitist concept to think that just physical infrastructure or you know walkability, physical environment, green space is going makes people healthier because disadvantaged people get the get their definite their version of walkability is lack of green space, increased air pollution, increased risk of injury, um, and noise. And and so this is something that uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is having us focus on. We've just created a new national walkability environment index that combines these adverse health impacts so that you see a fair reflection of who you are versus the physical environments in which you live. Yes, in Seattle, that's very true. You know, the, the impacts of traffic to and from the port and in and out of the airport and then the adjacent neighborhoods, right? And then, of course, some of those port trucks, the ones that were making short trips back and forth that remember the clean air uh, agencies person saying that's where trucks go to die. So it was the most polluting trucks out there were running, you know, frequent short trips through, through, through neighborhoods. So it really goes to, to, you know, not just the transportation infrastructure, but the land use decisions and the spatial decisions about who gets to live where um, and where we provide housing. Kim. Yeah, Mike, and I wanted to say something. This is one of the things I think we've seen in regional transportation plans as they're asked to do more and more. We do end up with sort of dichotomous goals sometimes with them. And I'll point out uh, two that are directly relevant to, to this question. One was the preference for housing to be uh, developed in high quality transit locations to increase transit use. But on the flip side, high quality transit corridors tend to be the ones that you're talking about, where now you are put more housing uh, in areas with more pollution exposure. Um, and the kind of flip side, uh, well, I, I don't know that I would say completely the flip side of that, is now we're being asked to look to, through our regional housing needs allocation plan that's also part of the regional transportation plan now in California, is that you'd only, you don't want to focus only on infrastructure and disadvantaged communities, but you wanna make sure you're getting housing in, in higher resourced areas as well. So you're, right. you're, you're doing both, they're both important. Yeah, it, it really is a sign, and, I, and I've gotta to go to our closing slides now, um, but, but it really is a sign of how we ask those corridors to do so much. And maybe there are some uh, residential and high transit corridors which have a lot fewer cars, right? It would take you to thinking about those corridors differently. Um, you know, the idea that um, maybe we should, I'm just, on, I'm just getting on the stump here. We should have more pedestrianized centers in, in our cities like we see uh, in other cities around the globe. And to some degree we've seen in American cities with the open streets movement and the closing of certain streets and in, in dense corridors. Um, but but really thinking about those those trade-offs and not assuming um, that everything has to fit in that corridor, including high volume of vehicles. Um, 
which it would be a, a change in American viewpoints in many places. Having said that, this has been really fabulous. We've gone over our time. I apologize to everybody. If you had a question in the queue, we are going to take a serious attempt to distribute the questions to the panelists and see if we can't get that into a wrap-up blog post, which we will email to everyone. Um, and so that'll be great. I want to give you a little, uh, you know, we our next panel, uh, we're very excited. We're hopeful to have David Zipper, journalist, and Jeanette Sadek Khan is going to do a perspective on transportation trends in our January webinar. We're pinning down the dates and time, so stay tuned. Uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Big picture. Where, where's the transportation world going? Um, I don't control our slow. Oh, there they are. Great. They're up. I didn't see them. So um, there you go. And I just want to say, if you like what we do, if you enjoy this, um, if you want to be part of a movement for more walkable, equitable, accessible, and inclusive places, think about becoming one of the many people who've supported uh, America Walks with a financial donation. You know, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We even have a TikTok and uh, share our materials. I want to say the Twitter threads on this has been great. Thank you for our attendees who shared those as well. And uh, thank you, everybody, for your participation and look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deb and Alex and Kim. Appreciate your inputs today. It was great. It's fabulous.